We have a check in front of them. Yeah, I just, uh, I couldn't get a I'm going to go here and tell them all these like, things. All right. Well, we are uh, reconvening for our next session. And uh, the focus of the first session was um, Father Alex's background, calling into ministry, his church planning experience, his current work in church revitalization. And um, in this session, we're going to, uh, this will be kind of an extended session, so we have two points of focus. The first is uh, Father Alex's work in a variety of digital ministries that have to do with theological education and formation. And uh, and then the second part of this is we'll, we're going to bring uh, Aaron up and continue the conversation about theological education in general within our cultural moment and within uh, the church. So uh, by way of introduction to this session, I first encountered Father Alex's work uh, before, long before we met uh, through a website that he uh, hosted and wrote most of the articles for, yeah. um, called The Common Vision. And apparently I'm maybe the only person who's ever come up to him and said, hey, I love your work on The Common Vision. He's much better known for his uh, far more broadly uh, disseminated uh, podcast, which is called Word and Table. Uh, and also for his online uh, House of Formation, St. Paul's House of Formation, uh, which is an online course uh, that, is, that is done on, on video. So one way to think about these different efforts is they involve different media. So the first common vision was text-based, so it's articles. Um, the second podcast is audio. And the third is video in a kind of course. So uh, we're going to uh, kind of talk about these different uh, uh, platforms. But the first question is, you know, why, how, how, where did you get the passion and the interest to be doing this kind of uh, cultural and theological engagement? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. With technology, I guess, I'm not different from most millennials. I think we just kind of grew up with it. But my, my, my dad's dad is like, he always had the latest stuff, and we always just played with it. I just, I like computers. I, I've always liked, I'm not like good at them, I don't code or whatever, but I've always just been comfortable around them, I always like them. Um, I don't know, in the same way someone likes to have a car, they work on their garage or whatever, you know, it's just kind of how I am. Um, but when I, it's hilarious that you're talking about common vision because I really consider that as part of a past life of <laughs> mine. I think before I got really, Invested in the church, I really fancy myself a writer. I still love to write, and I, I do from time to time. But um, at the time, when I was uh, I was kind of working at a dead end job, and later I was a teacher, and I just was reading. I had a lot of time at this job to just read stuff online, and it was when a lot of like social issues were starting to come up that affected Christians, especially around the Obergefell same-sex marriage decision and things like that, and there were just all these tapes flying all over the place. It was kind of when Twitter was starting to become a thing. And, um, you know, I just wanted, I just thought, like, I, I have thoughts about these things as a Christian, just sort of a, as a Christian, as a thoughtful Christian person, and I'll bet that other people seeing all these things come down the pike really want a Christian, uh, a, you know, Orthodox Christian perspective on them. I felt like I was seeing and it, but it was very kind of pundit -y, like a little bit like New York Times opinion section, that kind of thing. Was, that was the thing I was kind of going for. I wanted to have a place where people, Anglicans especially, could go and kind of get, what, do, what should we be, how, how should we be thinking about what's going on? And I felt like I, I always kind of wanted to elevate the discourse a little bit to be much more charitable and much less accusatory. But also very firmly, very firmly uh, proud of who we are and what we believe. 
And um, I invited some other people to do it. And it really ended, though, when I was being very definitely called into ordained ministry. Um, I started to kind of think, like a lot of writer writers had dropped off. And I think for a while I started to get uncomfortable as I became more and more of a pastor, um, sharing very freely my opinions on things, my personal opinions on politics, even stuff, stuff I didn't think mattered to people, like entertainment or things like that. I could like be, take, give you like a really spicy take on why this movie is terrible or there, you know, and all very interesting. But it just, I kind of came in the roots when I was at a clergy meeting one time and they, uh, our bishop had invited a bishop from Canada to come and he was a really powerful speaker. Um, and uh, he kind of, in the middle of the talk, just kind of stopped, he was talking about the theology of the priesthood. And I was up for being ordained as a priest. Um, my ordained, ordination had been delayed by our bishop and got very ill, so I needed to wait another six months. And at that time we had this meeting and I was sitting there and he was like, he just stopped his talk and he was like, why do so many priests do weird pseudo-political blogging? <laughs> and he just goes, it's weird. <laughs> and then he just goes, he wasn't talking to me, I didn't know. But he just goes, don't do that. Especially if you're a priest. Because your mouth belongs to God. <laughs> and I just like, to this day it gives me chills and I was just like, and then I was like, okay, I gotta just stop. <laughs> I still write today, I'll write once in a while for the North American Anglican, um, but on, I, I restricted myself especially to things that concern the church. Like, you know, if there's something that concerns the church that I feel is important, that people say, and all, also always the question, why is it important that people who don't know me hear what I think about something? Um, so I just like, I started, as I became more and more of a priest, I realized my they matter to me, but they just don't matter to me as a priest. I, there's different takes on that. Uh, and obviously, I think Peter is probably the person who has a little bit more of a graceful path through print medium, uh, and he'll be able to tell you how to do that. Well. But <laughs> I wouldn't point you to the competition. So that was very flattered, flattered that he, he read me. Um, I did want to know, I, a friend of mine was friends with the uh, editor in chief of the Gospel Coalition, and I talked to him on the phone. And he goes, you know, you Anglicans really need something like what we have. Because every time we post anything from an Anglican, our readership spikes every time we do it. He was like, you guys don't have an outlet that's working for you. Um, so I, I was, there was a time when I was like, maybe Common Vision could be that. And then I was like, I don't know. Uh, my mouth will see that. So. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so then tell us about the origin of the Word of Table mm -hmm. podcast. So, Word and Table was, like I told you, I had come into the Anglican Church, I found out that the church existed. I was very, I felt very grateful to be a part of it, but I just, there was so much I didn't understand about it, and I wasn't coming to it with a, uh, an attitude of skepticism. I, you know, things that were new to me, like the baptism, like all the ritual, and the, the, you know, the real presence of the Eucharist, all these kind of new ideas to me. I very much trusted, because I knew the church existed, I trusted that these things were true and real, but I didn't really understand how to explain them exactly. And I was just like, you know, when I was uh, going to grad school, I was, you know, I had a very busy life, I was commuting all the time, and I was like, I just want to be able to walk into an old a church and just, just find a wise old priest and just sit down and have him just not so much because I wanted to know tons of stuff, but because I wanted to remain, I wanted to feel connected to the church. I just want that feeling. You know, maybe you walk in, maybe there's a choir practicing or something like that. I just, I wanted to be able to sit in that house for a while. Um, but your busy life, you don't really have that. Um, so I began to cook up this idea of well, what if we could kind of create that, like in an audio form, just a conversation with them who's wise and who wanted to just explain some things to you and just be a nice conversation. And that's, but I didn't know it's with the gorgeous choir singing. Yeah. The medieval monastery. The, yeah. Like that, right? There's a whole story behind that music too that I'll, I'll share in a second. It's a total God thing. But um, I didn't know Father Stephen at the time. He was our, he turned out to be our canon theologian, but I just heard him speak at a couple of meetings once in a while. And I was like, that guy. It's like, that guy is the guy. Like he 
he's the one I want to talk to. And I kept just wanting to schedule time with Steve to do this. And I was like, well, why don't I just do this on audio? So I remember he was a major accountant. Um, he was a government accountant. He had this like, big corner office in Chicago. So I went down there and I pitched it to him. And I didn't know him at all. But he was like, he thought about it and he was like, oh, I think God's in this. Let's do it. You know, let's, let's really do this. So we got started. And over the course of that time, I just became closer and closer to friends with him. You know, the early episodes that you can go back and listen to now, we barely knew each other. But as the time went on, we just became more and more close. And he really became a mentor uh, through, through doing it. I kind of had this idea of, ah, we'll just have a conversation about whatever. But Father Stephen was the one who really saw that, no, this could be a real catechetical resource and could reach a lot of people who are hungry for the tradition. And But Father Stephen had a genius, and he has a genius for really talking to people. He doesn't just want to give people info just for the sake of it. And like when I knew this thing was working was when I went to a conference at Beeson, and me and him were there, and some guy just recognized our name tags. <coughs> came up and was like, oh my gosh, I... Like, I grew up Baptist, I married an Orthodox woman, and we were just looking for the church that fits us, and the Anglican church is the one, so I've been just trying to understand. It's like, I am an auditor for uh, J.P. Morgan, and I was listening to your episode about what did Jesus know um, about his mi mis mission, and Father Stephen in that episode said, you know, it really is like the rules of internal controls. It's rules of internal controls are the people that need to know, you, you need to know only what you need to know to get the job done. Uh, and no one else needs to know. <laughs> he's like, that's that's Jesus. That's actually a pretty rough way with how the church describes Jesus. And thought, he knows he's the Messiah. He knows what his mission is. He knows he's God. But he doesn't necessarily know all of the mysteries of everything. He's a human being, you know, while he's, while he's, while he's in, in the natural flesh. So that guy told us, he said, I just pulled my car over and was just laughing. Because no one had ever explained it to me. Because that's what I do. Actually. Like this is that is my world. So like I knew that that was when I was working. I was like, okay, we're actually talking to real people where they are. And by God's grace, we we you know, we've seen a lot of people actually who are looking for Anglicanism or looking for the church at all. Simply like go and find a local ACM parish um, and be like, hey, I, I found this podcast and I want to join this church. This this really answers. So God really, and Stephen reminds me, he's like, no, I said yes, you know, not because I thought this was a brilliant idea, it's because of God, I thought God was in it. So, so yeah, that was, that was the genesis of it. So we've just been doing it ever since. It's my joy. Some pastors write books. Uh, this is what I do. This is, this is my dad. Um, so how, so how, how long has Word Table been going and how many episodes have you put out? About five years and about 100 and seven episodes, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, we could have done a lot more, but also the parish priest's uh, time is limited. <laughs> so we would love to put one out every single week, uh, but some, we, we, we moved to a bi weekly schedule for a year, so lately I've been trying so hard to get one out every week, but it's just been hard, and I don't release it unless it's good. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, about five years. How, how do you determine uh, what topics to address and once you've determined the topic, tell us about the process of, um, you know, developing your show notes and how you, yeah. how you uh, outline the material. Yeah, two ways. When I started, that was like, I just had questions, you know? So I had all the questions, and Father Stephen had the answers, but um, early on, we realized that Father Stephen especially, he really wants the conversations to be structured. It wants to be a conversation, but we need to know where we're going with the conversation, especially so we don't waste anyone's time. You know, there's a lot of podcasts out there that go on for like 50 minutes, and you know, 15 minutes in, they're still kind of joshing. You know, I don't know. Nobody has time for that. Um, so I felt very concerned that we keep this to 20 minutes in and out. Father Stephen was really concerned that we knew where we were going. So I would bring up a question. Father Stephen would then go and develop an outline that would answer that question thoroughly. And what we would do is we'd both get the outline, we'd read it ahead of time, and then I'd think, oh, we still did this, I'm like, okay, I know where this is going now. Um, because when we didn't know, when I didn't know where things were going, I would start asking the wrong questions, 
and start asking questions that just didn't really pertain to <coughs> exactly. So part of it was I was beginning the conversation with a guy that is, um, you know, because the faith is one, because the faith is true, there, frankly, is a definite answer for <laughs> a lot of these things. So having a sense of, you know, I might not know entirely how we were going to get there, but knowing where this is going was really important. Today, I'm a priest now, and I've read a lot more, and I know a lot more partially through with it, so I have fewer questions. So, but I will get questions from other people especially other people on the evangelical spectrum. Um, and and I'll, I'll be always having my ear to the ground, especially for my people. It's like, hey, what, are, what questions are evangelicals having? Or what, what are they wondering about? And then I'll feed Father Stephen that question and go into the outline. When I don't have that, Father Stephen, he, so he has a very fertile mind. So he will just do it out. You know, these days, I can just be like, let's record on Tuesday. And he'll come with three outlines on faiths that we haven't talked about. We have a whole spreadsheet of stuff we've covered, stuff we want to cover. Um, but yeah, some of them are mine, so now some of them are his. Like, I didn't ask about this mixing water and wine, he did. I did ask about sacrifice in the Old Testament, because I got a sense I was like, how we how sacri sacrifice in the Old Testament was seemed to be really misunderstood when I was growing up. Um, let's really talk about. You know, so it's it's a both thing, but we always have an outline that then it's my job to to turn into a conversation instead of just an outline. So we are going through our you know pre-planned route, but my job is to turn it into a conversation. So yeah, and and this you do very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you 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 play the role of the interested inquirer. That's right. Yeah, it's a. a um, it, uh, uh, quiz the sage is the my word for the format. Yeah, and there's actually it's funny. It, I'm not I'm not recommending any politics or anything. But if there's one po podcast that you want to look up that inspired the format of Word Table most, it's called the Libertarian Podcast. It's with this lawyer and the guy. Like the notable thing about it is the guy is just brilliant. His name's Richard Epstein. He's in Chicago. Stephen Gotti type guy. Right? Yeah. yeah. Stephen Gotti type guy. Um, just can cite each chapter and verse in every case that's ever here. Yeah. But the way that that guy inter introduced him and asked the question is always like 15, 20 minutes. He says the same thing at the top of every single episode. And so you just know where you're going. Um, the music fades out really quickly. So you know that you're going to be done with this, but even you're cute, you know. So I just, I really wanted to stick to that format. Um, can I talk about the music really briefly, please? It's, when I became first, when I was, I was still Baptist, I was young, I was like 14, 15, like freshman in high school, when we started trending toward being interested in the sacraments in the liturgical church, my dad was in a Catholic gift store somewhere, and he bought this album called Sublime Chant, and it's by a guy named Richard Prue, and the group is called The Cathedral Singers. And he played it a few times, and it just entranced me. I had never heard music like that. And I, and I love music. Um, I had never heard, uh, I would never heard tunes like that. Um, and there were certain movements in them that I just, there's one, um, they're just, just little phrases in them that were just, like, just breathtaking and beautiful. And I, heard, I, I looked up other chants, kind of CDs and stuff like that, and nobody quite did it like that. So I, honestly, like, I would drive, I was in the band in football in, in, a, in high school, and I would just, I was on the, I was a weird kid. I was on the bus, and I would listen to that all the way through, time and time again. It just became part of my prayer. And I didn't know Latin, still don't. But like, it was just so worshipful for me. I just felt so caught up in it. And um, it's long been my favorite thing. I listen to it constantly, all the time. And uh, when I started this podcast, I was like, I want music, I want good music. I really want that music. Um, I was like, but surely I can't get it. So I looked up some other options, and they were way too expensive, and whatever. But I looked up this group called GIA Publications, which is a big cat, like Roman Catholic uh, publisher for liturgical music. And it turned out it was right there in Chicago. It was local. And I and Richard Prue turned out had died in 2010. 
this was now like 2015, and I was like, ah, oh, I missed him. Like, he was just like my idol, and I, I didn't even know he was here. But a lot of people who worked with him were here. So I called him, and I was just like, hey, like, I'm starting this podcast. I'm an Anglican, but, you know, the Rome Church means so much to me and my family. Can you let, like, I don't have a lot of money, but I would love to pay you yearly to be able to use these albums. And they were like, they, they like normally would not have granted that, but they were like, well, yeah, all right. You know, the guy there, Kyle, was just so nice. And uh, so every year they charged me $250 <laughs> to use as much of that as I want for the podcast. And it was just a total, like, I can't tell you how much of a Holy Spirit moment that was for that to be so important to me growing up. And then all of a sudden, talking to these people and being like, oh, I can officially, I have a contract now to use this on the podcast. It just felt very confirming that the Lord was like, I was always preparing you for this. <laughs> so in any of these things, it's like, it's not you, it's not your cleverness. It's like God really prepares you for stuff and it makes it happen. So, yeah. yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Let's have questions on the podcast first, then we'll talk about it. Yeah. 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 How long into your podcast did you come up with the idea to have a format? Oh, that was from the beginning. Um, I really, yeah, I had that in my head from the beginning for sure. I so think the, with the outline and everything, he could be. Um, uh, the, the Father Stephen more brought the outline to that. I think I had a lot more confidence in my ability. I thought it would be more back and forth, more give and take, more kind of will chart the course on a given topic as it goes along. But I knew I wanted it to sound like this. So in the beginning, the conversation, like the rule in podcasting, I didn't make this up, but someone told me and I learned it to be true, is that the more you plan on the front end and the more you can get done on the front end, it means you're going to spend way less time fixing it on the back end. That's probably works for any thing you do. But uh, this for sure, because I was, you know, like a very whatever millennial, like, yeah, we'll just talk, and I'll record it, and then I'll just, like, fix it afterwards. Well, I was like, it took me six hours to, like, edit this conversation down to the relevant portions. So we just basically did it on the front end. Like, Father Stephen was the one who was like, well, hey, I'll, just, I'll make an outline. So that's the editing done on the front end. So now I just have to edit very minimally, just take out bums and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I was, I was asking. How, how long into the process, how many, had you done before you said this is way too much work? <laughs> I'd say that the first, I don't know, the first five to ten were a ton of work. And then I just got smarter. Like, well, the other thing was we got to know each other a lot better. So we would, like, in the beginning, we did multiple takes of the same episode. And then I would take the good bits from each one and kind of splice them together. Now we don't have to do that because we just, know each other very well. I know the sorts of things, if I pop off with one thing, you know, Father Steve's not going to be able to follow up with it. Uh, but I do know now the things that, that do just, you know, you just learn, you learn the person. And I was really very much like, Father, I really viewed him as my mentor, you know, and me kind of as his curator, like someone who's um, bringing out what he's devoted his life to. So I, I spent a lot of time learning as I did that, it just got cleaner and cleaner. So, yeah. Yeah. Do uh, you have a favorite episode, or would you say some greatest hits? Um, great question. For it. <laughs> it's kind of a blur for me. Um, the ones that we keep giving to people that we find the most use for are uh, the first few, Matter Matters, which talks about the sacramental worldview, which gives people just a con, just the background you need to start talking about sacraments. Um, I really liked uh, the, there was there were a couple of episodes that had a story behind them that make them my favorite, and it was when we talked about infant baptism. And infant baptism is, as you all know, that's when you do that. That's the move from you were Baptist evangelical. And when you it, like in the Reformation, it was like, are you at the Reformation, it was like, are you giving Eucharist in both kinds? That's when you know you've, you're at the point of no return. 
Now, with us, with your broader evangelicalism, it's infant baptism. Like, you've really crossed. So I knew it was going to be a big episode. Um, I was trying so hard to kind of, but I still, I, I was trying so hard to get the conversation just right. And I was asking these questions that I knew that people were asking. Well, like, how does coming to, how does coming to Jesus and being saved, getting saved, how does that have to do with faith? If you have a kid who can't understand the concept of faith, you know, do we say that infants have faith in someone? And Father Stephen, I was telling Aaron and Peter yesterday, he doesn't, he doesn't power through a conversation if you're not asking the right questions. So we kept doing take after take after take, and it just wasn't working. And I realized through the course, I was very frustrated, but I realized through the course of it that I didn't understand salvation. There was something about the way he talked about salvation that was different than I was talking about. I was talking about this moment where you get saved, and uh, then you know, you're justified, and then you have some sanctification afterwards too. But he was talking about it as this movement toward intimacy with God. This I had never read anything about theosis before. I'd never read anything about the, the soul's movement and transformation into the likeness of God through Christ, through faith. And I was like, once I, and I just remember thinking, I told the Father, we have to back up and do an episode on salvation first, and then we need to do the episode on infant baptism. That was a moment for me that I understood something that I hadn't understood before. So that was a favorite for me. I don't know how the episodes really came off, but like, for me it was a real favorite because of what happened in me through it. The last one I'd say was the one we did on predestination, because we knew, uh, Father Stephen and I were, we, 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 we knew we were going to get pushed back on it. Um, the way Father Stephen and I explain predestination, especially from our, 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 our you know, more reformed folks. But they liked it. Everybody liked it. <laughs> they were like, yeah, I wouldn't have said it quite that way, but you know what? You guys are fine. You're in the family. <laughs> and if you're an Anglican, being fully Catholic and fully reformed, uh, it just, it felt, I felt very confirmed, like, ah, yes, we've, we've spoken rightly about God, if everyone is, recognize that. Yeah, I recognize what you're saying. Have that recognition, so that's what I would do. Yeah. On a technical side, what do you use for editing software? Yeah, well, when I started, I was using Audacity, which is free stuff. Um, and it works great. It works great. I'll, I'll recommend Audacity if anyone. After we got the Patreon up and after we got St. Paul's Observation running, we had some money. So now we have uh, Adobe, the full Adobe suite, and I use Audition. And I really recommend Audition. I just don't think there's anything else out there. Alternative, at least until Black Magic gets on making their version of Resolve, I guess, for audio, I would say. But I, right now, Audition is kind of what keeps us latched to Adobe, I would say. We use Premiere for St. Paul's House, too, but we could use Resolve. It's a lot cheaper and, frankly, a lot better in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Less a question, more of a comment. Just for myself and others that know the various episodes on, like, Eras, the centuries mm -hmm. of the church and like the church fathers. Yeah. Were all very helpful. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, those were super fun. Yeah. Those are ones that I call that, um, that I call those a download um, because there's not a whole lot I can, uh, you know, offer. You know, some of them I'll, I'll be like, all right, Leslie, this is just going to be a download. You're just going to tell me the story. Yeah. And I'll kind of be going, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. <this. laughs> but he's always like, oh, really? I really want you. Oh, it's better. I'm like, I'll, I'll do my best, but you know the story. So we're gonna, yeah. And yeah. How much time do you spend on this per week? Start to finish. several episodes at once.
once, and we'll do it every other week, sometimes every three weeks if we've got enough. So that's about two and a half, three hours, and then each episode every week is reliably one hour. So I'd say all told, to get an episode in and out the door is about two hours, hour and a half, two hours. Uh, hour and a half if it's short, where right? things are just clipping, you know? So it's not that bad anymore. It's not, not that, but when I started, like, that's not how it was. So you just get better, and you know your process better and better, and it just gets cleaner and cleaner. Yeah, but you really, there is no, <coughs> There's no substitute for really long hours figuring it out. <laughs> but now it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for listening, by the way. It's a huge encouragement to me, seriously. And I, I'm very, very happy to know that we're not just throwing it out there, you know, and that it's actually blessing people. How many uh, downloads does the podcast have on a typical uh, episode? Oh, on a typical episode? Yeah. Um, about. You know me with numbers. Uh, I, it's a, it's a, it's around. It's somewhere between. I think it's like fifteen hundred, maybe, or something like that. Um, it's hard to know when you're doing a podcast um, how many people are listening. What you can see typically are just times people has clicked the have clicked the button, um, and you can kind of judge from there reliably how many people. And but per episode, like. Let me just look at the, the last couple episodes we've had, because it varies, and it goes down if we're not as... Yeah, our last one was 940, Fruits of the Spirit was 1,061, Fruits of the Spirit was 1,070. Yeah, somewhere a little bit north of 1,000, I'd say. So I've been able to judge that to say, I think we have close to 1,000 listeners, uh, which is not a big podcast at all, um, but we've been very, very pleased with the consistency. Well, um, so, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, it might not be Joe Rogan, but it's yeah. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. perhaps the largest in the ACNA. Well, yeah, and uh, yeah, that's a low bar, but but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I guess that's that's probably true. That's probably true. Yeah, the thousand people, and I assume it's the same thousand people in every week. Um, one thing that we do have is that. The way that it's set up is it's not really time bound. So it's the kind of thing where I learned the term evergreen content, um, which means you can always go back and listen to it. You know, a new listen, a new listener will always find reason to go back and listen to past episodes. It's not like, oh, the topic of jour has already passed. It's not timely, you know, and that was one of the things that I thought I really like about it, is that I know that when we put something out there, it Stick or it has some staying power um, because it's about universal things. So, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. um, it sounds as though this would be something if, if you are someone who's going to be um, teaching or helping teach a confirmation class or a new member class, like this might be, be very helpful if you can listen to some of these and to be able to get answers to some of these questions. Yeah, we, we actually, I can show you, one of my buddies, who was actually, he was in, he was a really faithful member of Logan Square, and him and his family, and then uh, he moved to Colorado recently, and joined the Anglican Church there, and actually they were using Word and Table at, in their confirmation class. Um, and he's, he was like, oh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> I, I still, you know, I still play over lunch with him. Did he tell you anything about how they, how they yeah, actually, he sent me their curriculum. They're like, you know, <coughs> this class, and it was very organized. It was like, this class is this, this, and this. This class is this, this, and this. And they, they had pulled out episodes. Obviously, the priest was an avid listener, and he'd done something that we've been wanting to do that we haven't done yet, which is to index them by topic. And uh, and he, he'd indexed them, and he kind of filtered them into his curriculum. So that's one of the things that we, we want to do. We want to actually kind of collate it so that it can be a resource for people, um, you know, beyond just it popping up on your phone. So, yeah, I, we really need to get on that. <laughs> yeah. You upload the uh, show notes as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, pretty minimal at this point. Um, with the Gospel of John, I've been, I've been really excited to see some advancements in, in some of the podcast apps and stuff, and I really like now how you can touch, like if they create links to time codes, 
you can touch them and jump straight to that time code. So one of the things we're working on with the Gospel of John is being able to code in those time codes per verse. You know, so it should work like an audio commentary. Uh, so I, I really like, it doesn't really work for a word table, but I really like that feature a lot. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about uh, St. Paul's house of yeah. creation. Um, this kind of emerged, I guess, out of, in a sense, work table. Started it first, and then um, you kind of started working on St. Paul's. Um, I guess my understanding is, really, you were kind of doing St. Paul's in person with a group of people and Father Stephen That's right. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so then you started to think about how can we make this available to the broader. Yeah, so St. Paul's house is basically Father Stephen has long had, had a vision to give a more comprehensive curriculum on, you know, four semesters and throughout those four semesters, about 50-ish lectures. That will cover the breadth of the tradition um, and really give people a, a beginning working knowledge in the great tradition. So it covers everything from history, theology and liturgics, um, sacraments, uh, patristics, church fathers, and uh, church history. So all those five topic areas, we were like, he wants to he wanted to create something where all of those things would be woven together in a single whole, because we believe that the church is one, and it is it is one story, it's one thing. Um, so he wanted to be able to do that. Uh, at the time, we were both working in the greenhouse movement, and the greenhouse movement's uh, desire was that the greenhouse movement really help is their their job is that they try to help um, local missions in different places, especially places that are disconnected, and try to get them resources and things to help their churches and church plants get started and get off the ground. And so their interest was, well, we need, if we're really serious about getting people to start churches on a grassroots level, we need to be really serious about getting real formation to them, real training to them, where they are, so that they're not picking up and having, you know, being told, well, you know, you need to pick up and go get a degree somewhere. Um, that's just not where most people's heads are. They're, I want working knowledge and what I'm doing here, people are looking to me as a leader, as a pastor, I want to be formed in that. So Greenhouse really wanted its missionaries to go through something like this. Um, so that had already been sort of commissioned, and Father Stephen was working on it. And they were meeting in a little cohort, in a, in a cohort group in Chicago. And what they would do was just put a, I was doing word and table at the same time as this was happening, I wasn't involved. But they had like an iPhone in the back of the room and it was just like, then they would just like email out the link of the lecture. And obviously like the sound quality, you couldn't hear it, you couldn't understand what I was saying. It was just, for the people who were away from the main hub, it was just a nightmare trying to go through it. Um, so they brought me on to try and improve that experience. and. I came on the team, and I kind of, I, I, I really wanted it to be something that just looked, looked very nice, and that we could really, the people that were remote from us, could, we could really honor their time, I guess. So I kind of had this idea of like, we need a website for you to be able to go there, and the lecture is there, and you're looking at the outline while the person is lecturing to you. But we needed it to be on video because Father Stevens, he's a very dynamic communicator. And sometimes there are things in that lecture, we wanted people to feel like they were sitting in a lecture environment, being lectured by the professor, wherever they were. So we needed it to be on video, but we also needed people to have text of the outline. So we kind of came up with a site structure to be able to do that. Um, we started shooting the video, and God blessed us with this amazing photographer kid who Adam Moody, who just was just, he was a workaholic nut with cameras. That's just amazing. We ended up paying him later. Um, <laughs> he, he jumped in out of the love of it, and it was because he was learning, and because he needed internship hours and stuff, and we were like, yeah, but I'm telling you, like, this kid, I've never had an intern work like this kid work. It was crazy. Um, so he was a huge part of the success. I kind of became the director a little bit more, and um, but then we got, we, we already had students, so we already had a very minimum final product. We already had people paying us a student investment fee, so we used that to buy a particular, like, custom, to get a custom website built that was able to embed video in the way that we wanted it to. 
Um, but St. Paul's house, basically, we, so St. Paul's house became, is, Word and Table is kind of the snack version of St. Paul's house. Um, and St. Paul's house is kind of cover everything. Yeah, it's, the, it's kind of the full meal. Um, but we knew that we needed it to be in community, that it wasn't just, we didn't, we never wanted this to be just an online learning thing. There were tons of those, and the biggest problem is, you know, uh, Father, Father Aaron probably has uh, a lot of opinions about why those are, 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 uh, are, less, are less than the ideal in the first place. For us, we were very much like, people don't finish these things. You know, people don't wake up one day and they're just like, I think I'll do my next online learning class that no one is holding me accountable to. <laughs> you know? so, and we wanted people to finish. We didn't want people to just sign up and give us money. We wanted to that we, the, our goal was to actually give this stuff. So we, we, we've always, you know, St. Paul's House is two things. You sign up for the website, but then you get a call from me if, if you're you know, a first-timer or from Danny and we're like, hey, St. Paul's is an ideally done in community with a cohort of people, kind of like Alpha. And it's like, we, are there two or three people, if it's a single person we've never heard of from before, who go like, you know, who's your priest, who's your bishop, uh, if, if that applies? Um, do you have two or three other people? or maybe four or five, or maybe eight or 12, who you think would really like to go through this with you. And so nine times out of 10, people say yes. And we actually get groups of people meeting face to face. And what we decided to do was just, okay, let's just connect those people a few times every semester over like a Q&A webinar with Father Stephen, so that the questions that they have, which we don't expect cohort leaders to be experts in this stuff, we expect them to collect questions and facilitate conversation uh, and process the material, especially people's emotions as they're going through it. And so I'll do a call with the cohort leaders a couple times per semester, and then we'll get all of the folks who are involved on a webinar at <coughs> one times to, with Father Stephen. Um, and we were doing Zoom long like before COVID happened. Then COVID happened, and everyone was doing everything on Zoom. And for the first time, we had cohorts doing cohorts on Zoom. <laughs> literally down the street from each other, <laughs> which was surreal. And I'm really glad those days are starting to be behind us, one hopes. But anyway, that was, that was, that was the genesis of St. Paul's House. Um, but it's, it's largely, it, it's part of an overall desire for us to basically uh, to, to hand on what's been handed to us. So we don't consider, so if we're involved in St. Paul's House, we can talk about it later, we'll talk about we don't really consider ourselves like teachers exactly. We consider ourselves traditioners. That we tradi tradi traditio literally means to hand it over or to hand on what's been handed to you. So we kind of uh, we've been more forming through our staff and other people that have started to come around us, kind of an order of traditioners. That our job is not to teach, not to instruct people on what they should think, but our job is simply to take the tradition that has been handed to us and create in clever ways ways to hand that on, um, in however way it works, and use digital technology as a tool to be able to do that. Those are the tools of our time, um, so we're going to use those tools to do that in the same way that you know monks earlier on used the scriptoria to to do that. So that's that's kind of the idea. So you have, uh, it's a two year, well, four semester program. Mm -hmm. Currently. Um, and right now you have three terms in a the year. There's a spring term, there's a summer term, which is condensed, so you do kind of two yeah, and seven a week. Yeah. And then there's a fall term. Mm -hmm. And so, and to go through the whole thing, it's, it's four, uh, four semesters, mm -hmm. four terms. Yep. And um, so how many uh, students, just roughly, will you have um, kind of in all of the different classes at once. Yeah, we'll have between, we've had consistently between 50 and 90. Uh, right now, we're right in the middle of there, we've got like 70. Mm -hmm. um, 70 to 75, I think, right now. Um, we haven't quite cracked 100 yet, that's our goal. We really want to have more than 100 students mm -hmm. per semester. Um, but yeah, we, we've had consistently, we, we, we really consistently had, and I'm talking for the spring and fall, right? The summer is usually like a lot smaller, right? But right, yeah. So one one uh, 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 piece of content.
contacts or information that Bishop Clark was eager for me to uh, make sure to communicate in our conversation today uh, <clears throat> is that um, you know theological education and formation, of course, is a concern across the church and every bishop, every diocese is kind of in this moment having to ask serious questions about how do we do theological education and formation in our diocese. Uh, and so it's an ongoing conversation within, within our diocese, something that um, uh, Aaron has been deeply involved with as our camp theologian. Uh, we do have uh, uh, kind of ongoing formation happening in both in Houston and here uh, in Lafayette. Yeah. And Bishop hopes to have a uh, location also on the west side of the diocese as well. Um, awesome. So it's it's kind of an important thing uh, that we're all working on, yeah. and so in light of that, what I wanted to do for uh, kind of our our last uh, portion of our discussion is to actually bring Aaron up, and so if Aaron would come up, he's going to take my spot, and uh, we're going to continue the conversation, but talk in light of St. Paul's uh, House of Formation, yeah. talk about you know. Theological education and theological formation. How do we do that in our present culture? How do we do that in our church? And how do we do that in our parishes? Uh, you know, even when we're far away from seminaries and you know, these other kind of institutions. Yeah. So, what's the? We'll take about twenty minutes. So here, uh, whatever needs to be seen, we're, I'm, in, I'm on this team of people in the diocese, and we're really looking closely at what this takes to you know, lead somebody through a process of education formation that results in a person who is uh, not only informed, but somebody who has the, the character that will uphold underneath the weight, the incredible weight, maybe increasing weight of ministry within our time. What does that look like? And why, why are the seminaries coming up short? And what do we do about it? And how do we care for our own here? And 
so that's so the bishops really kind of put me up front and all of that, and uh, and I'm excited about that. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. So uh, I think accidental, not accidentally. You know, Here, you know, there just happens to be a community of people who have academic interest in uh, preparing for holy orders. Or, you know, I was new to the family. We were to the family here and preparing for holy orders, perhaps, serving that. And, you know, I'm a teacher. I teach. That's what I do. Like, it's the thing I do when. Nobody's asking me to do it. Uh, and so we've, we've been able to see God kind of draw together a small group. And uh, I think we've made some headway over this past year. Um, really giving ourselves to uh, some of the, the deeper kind of preliminary questions that come before we can start to show them. Because here's the thing. Uh, everybody wants to know, like, where did you go to seminary? And today, a lot of people might say, well, you, you should thank God that I maybe didn't, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not trying to poke anybody in the eye, but there, there are just there, there are a lot, there are lots of reasons why seminaries are falling short. And our, you know, my, my focus is understanding those reasons and um, reimagining theological education in ways that are fit and that are actually fruitful. Uh, and I can talk
questions or comments, uh, we can really open this up and, and have a conversation. Uh, here. So one of the things I think is great about Anglicanism as ACNA has invented it is the um, attraction of um, maybe somebody from an evangelical background who, who can see orthodox theology mm -hmm. and discovers liberty yeah. and its beauty and the awe of the worship. We've always had a handout. Okay. That's all. So we have that. And yet there is this contingent that of they're probably cradle Episcopalians who became Anglicans who are like, mm, you know, back. You're not certifiably Anglican. We're not sure we want you here because you might change something. You're, you're not our set. Yeah. yeah. So in your formation process, which when I use that word, I widen it down to every person in the pew. Yeah. Um, where are you on that subject? On evangelicalism? No, on just the, you know, is this a is this a wide net? Oh, yes. Supposing that you have the, you know, that you pass the orthodox question. So the, the that's a great question because at with St. Paul's we have a, a big mix of people from a lot of different traditions. A lot of people coming to us aren't Anglican at all. Um, but what we do, what, and this is always the question when it comes to Anglicanism. Some people are very critical of it. This is way too broad of a net. What, what is this whole Anglican thing? Are you just putting on a collar and saying your thing and doing liturgical stuff? But you're really just, you know, Calvinist with candles. Or, or, or like diet Roman Catholic. You know? Um, and this is where, like, with, with Word and Table and with St. Paul's House, we really, we begin from the place of um, that Anglicanism is one of the traditions that has maintained the form of the first five centuries of Christian we focus heavily in Word and Table and St. Paul's House on those first five centuries and the consensus points of those centuries. We, you know, we read the Fathers um, in season. Uh, what we want to do is establish that this is the trunk of the tree. All the other traditions and stuff as various historical things happen have all branched out. But at the end of the day, every single Christian should be able to recognize their distinctives in that, in that single trunk of that tree, represented mostly by the first five centuries of the church. That's why we get, that's what I tell them. I'm like, listen, you, if you come from a Presbyterian tradition, Baptist tradition, Methodist, you know, you all as branches off of this tree, you should be, there, there are points where you're going to recognize yourself those distinctives that you bring to it. And we say, come on, you should. Um, there's a lot more, though. There's not less, there's more. Um, there, it's, it's basically like, you know, with Baptist mind heritage, this deep missionary zeal, uh, and this, like, that, you find that. Um, with with reform, the Reformed tradition, Calvinism, the, this, this uh, emphasis on the sovereignty and power of, and providence of God, you find that um, in Roman Catholicism and, and Eastern Orthodoxy, you focus on the, the, the sacramental presence of our Lord in our midst, truly, that's there. It's all there. There's just more. And especially when you get into the Protestant traditions, I think you've seen breaks and splits that have emphasized one or two of these distinctives, but haven't got a sense of the whole, which is what that word Catholic whole, the universal church. We're after the whole. Um, and that's why I think there are some temptations for Anglicans, especially traditional Anglicans, to really define down Anglicanism to a set of distinctives. Whether it's a prayer book language, or a certain kind of liturgic, or something. And that's Anglicanism. And I can show it to you because I'm a Cranmer scholar, and this is what he thought, or something like that. We're after the, fur the trunk of the tree. Um, and that's what we're, like, this is what I'm most passionate about, uh, is, is really having a place where, yeah, everyone can come around that truck and that tree. You know, you're going to see yourself in it, but you're going to see a whole lot more. It might challenge you, it might offend you. Anglicanism has something to offend everyone. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it, that, that pain means coming into the fullness uh, of, the, of, of the tradition of the faith, the trunk of that tree. So, yeah, that's a great question. I'm really happy you brought it up. Because that is what I'm most passionate about with formation, is that. Because um, it cannot be a place where yet you come in as a Pentecostal, 
you know, people are like, well, you're going to have to get rid of a lot of this stuff if you want to hang out with us. No. Charismatics, I love charismatics because they get the sacrament. They're, they expect the Holy Spirit to show up. They're just like, it's over there. Oh, okay. <laughs> they get it. Everyone gets a piece of it, but it's the whole. And that to me is what Anglicanism can bring to the Well, I mean, I agree with you that the thing we need the most of is, um, you know, more Anglican churches. But you know, maybe if someone had a slide earlier today, we need pastors to be there. So uh, it seems to me this is very much a chicken and egg mm -hmm, mm -hmm. conundrum. And yes, the question is, you know, the current model seems like woefully inadequate to generate the numbers that will. Yeah, I'd be curious if you know the model. The model you're using. Well, we, we don't have a model yet. Well, <laughs> that's the point. Is yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you you're talking about the old seminary. The seminary. The model. whole experience, right? If, you know, um, I don't know, I think they said it are a little bit disaster how many congregations there were. 600, does that sound right? 2,700, I don't know what I'm trying to remember. In the Lutheran church, it was. 400, 500, and then in the ACA, it was about 1,000. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, if you wanted to have a, you know, 5% growth rate, which is really not particularly impressive, we'll take it. you got to have 50 new pastors each year. Mm -hmm. That doesn't count for the churches that are closing each year. And that doesn't count yeah. for retirements and all that kind of stuff. So, so I, I think um, the question for me is, where do those people come from? Right. And are they already being looked to as leaders? Very often they are. And very often what's needed is to take those people that are already building their local congregations to be able to um, recognize gifts that they have, give them the formation that they need, but in such a way that they're like, that's built into them from the formation this is what we are training you for. And so you mean that would be from, I'm sorry, I didn't grab it. So are you saying that would be from other, you know, denominations or sources, or would that just be from our lady that has no association at all? I'm very, you mean in, in our ACMA churches? No, I'm saying these people, you, these leaders you're looking for, where do you go find them? In, in, in our churches. But I mean, are they Baptists? Are they no, in our ACMA churches. Like in, in our current ACA church. So they are truly laid that have that have not even yeah. stepped one foot. That was that was my point. Okay. Yeah. That's why I have special interest in it. It's not the only way to do it. And of course, yeah, I accept everyone from everywhere. Um, but it, it seems to me that the especially the church in Acts, uh, it's spread through all kinds of missionaries going out. Um, and the leadership of the churches came up through those churches. Um, and uh, we, we had a dynamic in the mm -hmm. diocese in Chicago where someone would really come up, have a lot of giftings, want to get started, and we would need to, we would send them off to seminary somewhere. Well, something would happen no matter where they went, whether it was <laughs> Duke or Wheaton or even, uh, even Neshota or Trinity, but often they would not come back with that same zeal to and expand and grow the local church. They wanted to publish. <laughs> or, or sometimes they would change traditions. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not blaming the seminaries specifically, but it was very clear that these, these institutions were not interested in our churches in Chicago. So we were kind of like, what? We, we, we frankly, one of the reasons St. Paul's transformation came about was because we just ran out. We were, <laughs> yeah. The missionary theologian Leslie Newbigin has this brilliant line uh, that nobody really knows about, but he says, uh, The problem with this is years ago, this is 50 years ago, I'll tell you more about Leslie Newbigin another time, but he said, The problem with seminaries today <clears throat> is that they seem to prepare students for churches that already exist. He says, We're, th That is over. 
We need to re we need to encourage, nurture, bring people up into a missionary identity. The church requires uh, it needs to re-embrace its missionary identity. And you know, if somebody's just getting a credential so that they can have a cushy job, you know, the other problem with these students is if they do continue uh, to have an interest in pastoral ministry, they get a sexier job somewhere else. Yes. They don't come back. Yeah. You send them away. They don't come back. And so, yeah, we need we we need to reimagine these things so that you know, formation happens in ways that allow people to really step into and embrace their calling, their missionary calling. Um, and so it's not, and this is something, and this is why I even hesitate to use the word seminary, because mm -hmm. as soon as you use that word, everybody in the room presumes to know yeah. what that means. Yeah. Right. All it means is see that. So, mm -hmm. so come up with a new word. It does, doesn't it? Just come up with a new word. Because yeah. I, want, I don't want people imposing what they <coughs> imagine the seminary is all about. Mm -hmm. We need something different. Uh, there's one other thing on that, too. It's that um, I think when I'm during my time, I didn't go, I didn't go full in there. I did a MT, I did a master's in theology. But I did get this sense, and I don't know, we're recording this, right? I, I'm, I'm not, I love tweeting. <laughs> It's so deep, dear to me. But I did notice a dynamic in kind of how we in our cohorts began to talk about the church. And it was this idea that um, theology is like the brain of the church. And the brain tells the rest of the body what to do. So the hope for the church, which we're also deeply disappointed in for mm -hmm. all of these reasons. <laughs> oh, it's so hard was if we get the brain right, if you go back, you know, because you go to, you go to some of people like, oh yeah, we want you to go back to your churches and sort of change how they think. It's like, you know, if you come back with all the, the theology that you can be the brain of that church and then tell the body what to do, and there are these kind of centers for theologians or pastor theologians are trying so hard to get at this tough thing, how does theology and pastoral, being a pastor, how do you make those things go together? Um, which to me, you know, at the same time I'm learning from Father Stephen, and he's like, and then I learned about this phrase, lex orandi, lex credendi, right? Which is the prayer of the church is the law of belief. The, that's the strength of Anglicans. If you want to know what Anglicans believe? Look at how they pray. Read the prayer book. The prayer book, the, how you pray is how you believe. So it actually turns out that it's quite the opposite. You know, theology is not the brain of the church telling the body what to do. We get all the concepts right. Maybe. It is the grammar of the church's prayer. That it's the church's prayer. That is where our belief comes from. It is our prayer. And theology, people who are intellectually interested and gifted, uh, some more than others, uh, their job is to, it, it can be very helpful to codify and clarify the prayer of the church. <laughs> But, like, the prayer of the church is where theology, that's the fountain from which this all comes from. Theology is the grammar. You know, we're grammarians, and yeah, you need, you need that sometimes. It's helpful to codify, clarify, you can avoid some trouble, or you can cause some trouble. Um, but the idea that the seminaries are the place where the brain of the church is formed, and then they can go back and kind of take over all the members, it doesn't work like that. It's never worked like that. What's yeah. even more fun is the brain doesn't even the brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So uh, that's a, a great, we'll continue our conversation over lunch, uh, but that's a great place to uh, conclude our session in here, um, particularly because it brings us back to Romans 12, 2 and 3. That's, right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind in 2, right? Yeah. <laughs> but. Watch out, right? <laughs> Don't let that become your point of pride yeah. and uh, 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 something that will take you away from the true building up of the church, which in those following verses talks about all of the gifts given to all of the different people in the church, right? That's right. Uh, which, which then builds us up. So can we give uh, Alex a special <laughs>
available in the library and grab a plate, get some food, um, hang out, talk. Uh, we'll just let the conversation go through lunch and whenever you need to go. Thank you.